Great. <clears throat> great. Thank you for having me. So uh, yeah, it's a great pleasure to be able to talk to you about uh, the pulmonary hypertension crisis and in particular right heart failure. So to uh, build off of what's already been presented. So over the next 20 minutes, we're going to talk about evaluating pulmonary hypertension crisis. The definition of right heart failure, which has been already presented, but I want to touch on a little more. And then management decisions in pulmonary hypertension crisis, namely right heart failure. I have uh, no disclosures in the context of this presentation. So we have a gentleman and 49 year old gentleman, history of type two diabetes and pulmonary arterial hypertension. And he came in with syncopal episodes. He was passing out. The patient said he was in normal physical health up until a few days ago, then he ran out of his medicines. He had a diagnosis of pulmonary arterial hypertension and the focus in this talk will be on pulmonary arterial hypertension. And he ran out of his pulmonary arterial hypertension medicines, sildenafil and ambrosentin. Since that period of time, he's got increasing shortness of breath. And over the last four days, he had had intermittent syncope and passed out four times the day before. On exam, his blood pressure initially was maintained, 116 over 89, heart rate was 95. He was saturated 97%. He was alert and oriented. His JVP was high. His lungs were clear. He had one plus uh, lower extremity edema. This is his ECG. And on the ECG, uh, you can see that he has uh, sinus tachycardia, right atrial enlargement here on B1, as well as lead two right axis deviation, downwards in one, upwards in AVF. He also has um, a pulmonary disease pattern comprised of this right atrial enlargement. And then he also has an incomplete right bundle branch block. He's got a, a or prime here. And he demonstrated right ventricular hypertrophy as defined by the tall dominant R waves in B1 and B2. This was his chest X-ray when he came in. You can see a big heart cardiomegaly, and a big pulmonary artery here on the right-hand side, and just, yeah, overall, just a very, very big heart. No pleural effusions, and uh, maybe a little bit of uh, pulmonary edema, uh, but not too much. So when you have pulmonary hypertension crisis, you really need to figure out why, what are the reasons for the right heart failure. In the setting of the diagnosis of pulmonary arterial hypertension, which as we know is a vascular disease with large amounts of afterload that the right ventricle does not tolerate very well, what are the reasons why there's an acute decompensation that someone will develop right heart failure? And you need to look at this, you need to work it up, and, uh, and this will guide your evaluation and this will guide the testing. So it can be progression of disease, they can just have gotten sicker. Pulmonary arterial hypertension is a progressive disease. We have lots of medicines available, but none of them cure the disease process. It can be, such as in this case, medication non-adherence. We have medicines, they don't cure the process, but they work very well. And if you are to stop using those medicines, um, then you end up with a rebound. Pressures start going up, pulmonary vascular resistance starts going up, and people start doing more poorly. Where we practice, there's also a lot of methamphetamine or toxins and different toxins exposures can trigger um, an episode of uh, right heart failure. Pulmonary embolism, as was mentioned, uh, plays a significant role or can be, so you need to rule that out. And then ischemia and or infarction. And this can be right coronary artery your old traditional inferior MI, right, acute right coronary artery occlusion, or as I'll present uh, shortly, it can be chronic ischemia of the right ventricle that uh, has contributed to the right ventricle essentially burning out. Hypoxic lung disease is also in your differential. The patient could have, could have gotten pneumonia, could have aspirated. They could have a whole host of other reasons. 
Uh, we have had, we have unfortunate enough to have had some of our pulmonary arterial hypertension patients uh, develop COVID-19 and uh, become hypoxic from that. Um, and, uh, and that can cause a significant problem. And then it's actually also important to look beyond the right ventricle. Look at the parts of the heart, um, look at the parts of the body um, that are not right ventricular related, such as systemic hypotension and infection. Because if you develop a systemic, a process that results in systemic hypotension, then what's gonna happen? Your right ventricular pressures are going to end up being higher than your LV pressures. So you're going to end up, your LV will end up not being filled and your right ventricle will end up getting more dilated and uh, overworked. So you can develop right ventricular, or sorry, right heart failure from some sort of systemic process. This was his CT scan. And uh, you can see on this CT scan, this is the right lung, this is the left lung, this is a contrast CT. We were looking for um, uh, pulmonary embolisms and the aorta is here. And you can see his pulmonary artery is ginormous. It's got a huge pulmonary artery. And uh, there was no clot there and, and the lung film, the lungs themselves were quite clear uh, without signs of pneumonia or pulmonary edema actually, despite the initial concern on the chest X-ray. This is his echocardiogram. Got three views on the echocardiogram here. Hopefully the last one will play too. There we go. So on the top uh, left-hand corner, you have um, uh, power sternal long axis view. You got the left ventricle here, you got the right ventricle on top and the right ventricle is enlarged and uh, with significant flattening of the interventricular septum. And you have a small pericardial effusion here around the right, around the outside of the left ventricle. Here's the apical four chamber view. Again, you can see that the right ventricle is enlarged compared to the left ventricle. The interventricular septum is again flattened. It should be a lot more, um, moving a lot more vigorously than this, but it's flattened. And what you can also see, again, you can see pericardial effusion as well. And then you can see the right atrium is enlarged. And actually noteworthy is that the interatrial septum is uh, bulging from right to left and uh, consistent with elevated right atrial pressures. Here's a short axis view, left ventricle um, on the bottom, right ventricle on the top, and again, the interventricular septum being um, flattened. And then you have his um, uh, tricuspid regurgitant uh, velocity uh, estimated uh, right ventricular systolic pressure. So this is read as normal, and I agree with this, normal LV systolic function, interventricular septum was flattened, moderately increased left atrial size, severely increased pulmonary artery pressures. The inferior vena cava was dilated and there was a moderate uh, pericardial effusion without hemodynamic compromise. I will say that if um, the biggest predictor of adverse outcomes on echo in people with pulmonary hypertension is actually the size of the right atrium. The right atrium is the key to the whole game. Uh, if the right atrium is working, the patient does just fine. If the right atrium is dilated and not working very well, then um, uh, the patient does poorly. So the right atrium is key. And that's why throughout this conversation, I've always talked about right heart failure. Historically, we've talked about right ventricular failure, but um, you need more than the right ventricle uh, to work well. You also need the right atrium to work well. So you need the entire right heart to work well, or you'll develop right heart failure. And finally, uh, in relation to the echo, the thing I will say is that the actual least predictive of prognosis is the estimate for pulmonary artery pressures. And as you see in this slide, uh, pulmonary artery pressure estimate was about 50 or 60, and, uh, but his ultimate PA pressures were much, much higher. So the RVSP estimate is off by about 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury by the time it's this high. Okay, and this was his hemodynamics. Right atrial pressure of 20. PA pressures of 90 over 44 with a mean of 63. Wedge of 10, or pulmonary capillary wedge pressure of 10, pulmonary capillary occlusive pressure of 10. Cardiac output of 2.4 by FIC and 3.4 by thermo. Then a cardiac index of 1.4 by FIC and 1.9 by thermo. So some differences there. And the systemic pressure, which started off at least reported okay, the systemic pressure was 97 over 56. So you can see that his PA pressures 
are getting close to his systemic pressures. And that's again why I mentioned why it's so important that these people are so vulnerable to um, uh, systemic hypotension. So I want to discuss this definition of right ventricular failure or right heart failure. Because, and although it was, we've had um, nice information on, on proposed definitions, there is no universal definition. There is no universal definition of right heart failure. This has made it incredibly hard to study. Um, and in fact, the WHO uh, in this coming year is actually going to include right heart failure in its statistics for the first time ever. Prior to this, it hasn't even been tracked on an international level. So that's through large part through advocacy groups, in particular the Pulmonary Vascular Research Institute. But there is no universal definition. Dr. Draculus is coming on next, and he can give you very elegant definitions of left or heart failure or left ventricular failure, but there's none on the right. We feel that um, similar, there, there's lots of different numbers as, as Dr. Jones presented on, on different pulse waves and pulse pressures and stroke work index and so on. Dr. Draculus and Dr. Jones and I am a simple man with simple pleasures. And I think the definition can be actually quite simple. And I think it's a high right atrial pressure. That's why I said the right atrium is the key to the whole game. If your right atrium is failing and you're manifest by high pressures, and this actually is what you examine people as well, right? We, when we examine people for right heart failure, we look at the high JVP, we look at the peripheral edema, we feel for the uh, enlarged liver. And then what we're actually evaluating for is right atrial pressure. So high right atrial pressure, cardiac index less than two, and then systemic hypotension or signs of hypoperfusion, such as an elevated lactate, elevated creatinine, decreased GF4, troponin levels, uh, something along those lines. So we think if you have these features, you have right heart failure and you need to be treated in an urgent way. The reason you need to be treated in an urgent way is because with right heart failure, your in-hospital mortality for right heart failure is very high. If you are admitted, and Dr. Draculus is going to talk next, and is going to um, uh, is you know world renowned in left heart failure, but it's not that bad, Dr. Draculus. You have an in hospital mortality in your sickest patients with low blood pressure and elevated creatinine. Your in hospital mortality is sixteen percent. In right heart failure, if you have the same parameters, low blood pressure and a decreased kidney function your in-hospital mortality is 40%. You're almost got a 50% mortality if you have right heart failure. The in-hospital mortality overall for right heart failure is 14%. And this is important. 46%, if you get inotropes, if you are started on inotropes for right heart failure, your mortality is 46%. If you are intubated, with for right heart failure, your mortality now in the published registries is about 100%, is 100%. So if you have mechanical ventilation for right heart failure, you are facing a mortality of 100%. So we um, obviously in that setting try to do everything possible to avoid mechanical ventilation. There are various different reasons why the right heart suffers so much. You have a decrease in RV function, and then your right coronary artery perfusion pressure goes down because the right coronary artery, we always talk that um, coronary blood flow is diastolic in actuality. It's in the diastolic on the left side of the heart. It's systolic and diastolic on the right side of the heart, uh, typically. And um, in the setting of pulmonary arterial hypertension and reduced RV function, you end up with decreased perfusion pressure. You then develop ischemia, even without a right coronary artery infarct, such as Dr. Jones covered, you can still develop ischemia. And then you get um, transcript, transcription factor activation, uh, GRK2 activation. This changes your gene expression. And then um, you end up actually changing your metabolism of the right ventricle, decreasing glucose oxidation, end up with an adrenergic remodeling, beta receptor downregulation, and impaired angiogenesis. And what does this do? It feeds into further reduction in RV function. So you have this vicious cycle of right ventricular failure that is very hard to treat. But here are the proposed treatments. For pulmonary arterial hypertension, we have different pathways for the treatment of pulmonary arterial hypertension. 
we can work through the nitric oxide pathway with an increase in cyclic GMP. And we do that through, in, this, in, this, in our program, with sildenafil or tadalafil, PD5 inhibitors, so Viagra and Cialis. And there's another molecule that also works through the nitric oxide pathway, and that's through reaciguat, uh, works a little bit differently and also increases cyclic GMP. Then you have, um, you can inhibit vasoconstriction, these ones vasodilate. You can inhibit vasoconstriction through the endothelin pathway, three medicines available uh, where we practice ambrosentin, bocentin, and masitentin. And then you have the prostanoid pathway. You have the prostanoid pathway, which increases cyclic AMP and then contributes to vasodilatation. There are lots of different types of those medicines available. Iloprost, intravenous and inhaled, epoprostanol, intravenous and inhaled, selexapag is an oral agent, and triprostanol, an intravenous subcutaneous inhaled or oral agents. So these are the medicines that are available for us. So when you're managing in a pulmonary hypertension crisis, a pulmonary arterial hypertension crisis, and in this case, we gave him oxygen, we gave diuretics, we gave him sildenafil, and we gave him ambrosentin. And then the question comes up, what are we doing for inotropes? We've seen his blood pressure is wicked low. And what are we doing about prostacyclins? Inotropes is very hard. We did a survey on what is the preferred inotropes, an international survey over 100 uh, specialists in pulmonary arterial hypertension. And we asked them, what's your preferred inotrope in pulmonary arterial hypertension for right heart failure? Half of the population of our uh, said it was dobutamine. Half the population said dobutamine. And the other half said something else. A lot of people use mineralone, a lot of people use dopamine and norepinephrine, and then a couple of other things, some fennel. But it stands to reason that if half of people are doing one thing for right heart failure and the other half are doing something else for right heart failure, then nobody knows what they're doing. The mechanism of RV ischemia is important. Uh, as I mentioned, coronary artery perfusion is reduced in pulmonary arterial hypertension. Normally, this is your right ventricular pressure during systole and diastole, so, and this is your coronary perfusion pressure in systole and diastole. Your coronary perfusion pressure usually being about 120 over 80 and your right ventricular pressure being about 20 over, you know, 20 over 10 or 20 over 5. In this setting, when you have pulmonary arterial hypertension, your RV systolic pressure is so high that you actually end up um, functionally ischemic because you've lost 50% of the blood flow. You've lost that systolic uh, blood flow. That's so key to the right coronary artery. So therefore, this does require a vasopressor in addition to um, a true um, inotrope. So the Utah way, what we do in these settings is we use dobutamine, we use vasopressin, and we use uh, prostacyclin. The dobutamine is to be a dienotrope. The vasopressin is for increasing systemic pressures. You've got to increase systemic pressures. And then the prostacyclin obviously is for the um, underlying disease. The future directions in this area, and Dr. Jones has touched on some of these already, is the potential role for mechanical circulatory support for the RV. Impella, ORVADS, PROTEC, or VA ECMO. And a lot of the time you're resigned to P VA ECMO. The barriers, however, and these are key, key barriers, can't overstate them, is the lack of reversibility or at least the delay in reversibility for the pulmonary vasculature. In Stavros and Dr. Dracos's field and uh, in Dr. Jones's field, when people have acute heart failure or acute MI, you get to be able to turn things around pretty quickly. In pulmonary arterial hypertension, it can take a month to turn things around. Also, the other barrier is the potential of these devices to actually increase pulmonary artery pressure, as Dr. Jones showed. So the patient, uh, to follow up this patient, his lactate remained normal. We weaned him off of vasopressin and dobutamine, transferred him to the floor, diuresed him well on IV Lasix and then discharged him on ambrosentin, sildenafil, and triprostanol, and he's still doing well. So in summary, when you evaluate the pulmonary hypertension crisis, it requires thorough imaging, laboratory, and hemodynamic evaluation. The definition of right heart failure, I'll present you with ours, which is the elevated right atrial pressure, low cardiac index, and hypoperfusion. And then the management decisions in pulmonary hypertension crisis butamine, vasopressin, PGI2, diuresis, and oxygen, and then maybe some support. As Dr. Jones says, it takes a lot of, uh, it takes a team approach to do this. 
this is our team our, and, um, and this is our team motto that if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And a large team with uh, nurses, researchers, pharmacists, uh, intensivists. And, um, and uh, so thank you for your time. Uh, happy to reach out to you and looking forward to the question time. Thank you very much.